Welcome to Wine for Normal People, the podcast for people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. I'm your host, Elizabeth Schneider, author of the Wine for Normal People book and certified wine dork. And I'm MC Ice, just a wine-loving normal person. This podcast is sponsored by our exclusive sponsor, Wine Access. Wineaccess.com slash WFMP is how you are going to get the wine lover in your life the ultimate gift, a Wine Access gift card. What better way to tell somebody that you love them and are thinking of them than by getting them the choice of fantastic wines. A Wine Access gift card is the way to go this holiday season. Listen in the middle of the show for more detail. I was just saying to MCS, you know, it really doesn't pair well with Halloween candy if we haven't convinced you in the podcast with Kelsey and Colby. And yeah, what? Oh my God, I just had a sip of wine after Snickers. Don't do that. Why? Why? I, I mean, especially with the cheeses that you had earlier. Yeah, those were really right? good. I mean, yeah. the cheddar, brie. Let me just say bunch of stuff, and yeah, it all no. paired very well. No, no, no. Wine and Halloween candy is for people who have no sense of smell and taste. That's all I'm gonna say. Not a good idea. Except maybe pop rocks and champagne. That went okay. Oh, that's Remember right. that, that was, was like okay. the one thing. There were very few of those pairings that were passable at all. Non vomitous. By the way. I want to say this. I recorded the Sherry Part 2 podcast. If you have not listened to Sherry Part 1 and Part 2, let me give you a little incentive to listen because a lot of your fellow listeners have said, oh my gosh, I went back after listening and I tried Sherry again and oh, magic. You've converted I have converted some. So we have gotten a lot of positive feedback about people saying, I just gave it another shot this one time and you got me this time. Nice. It is time to go back and listen to those shows and to try Sherry. Could this be a series? Of what? Wines that you think (laughs) suck that are actually fantastic? Yes. Um, No, I don't think there's enough. The second chancers. Well, it's not going to be Pinotage, I'll tell you that much. I know everybody who's just seen me recently in L.A. That's got to be your least favorite wine, isn't it? It's the the only varietal I absolutely will not go anywhere near. But I will tell you this. Speaking of L.A., was just there. I did an event actually for Patreon. The, how cool is that? Wow, the company that's very is cool. So awesome that they hire their own people, that or their own creators within the community. That is to amazing. Do, yeah. Did to you do meet some other events. cool ones? Yes. I'm going to give a shout out to El Cordova, who everyone should listen to. And She's Rainbow Slime talented. Girl, who I'm going to do a wine and slime night. If anybody is interested in that, I'm. We just have to keep our kids from uh, harassing her too much. I mean, they're going to be posting on her site every day. They're already watching her videos religiously. She's actually really, really good. I see why they love her. No, met some very cool people, met some very big people in podcasting. Nice. The guys from Chapo Trap House who, you know, oh, they've yeah. got a huge, huge podcast. They were very cool. The really cool thing was the night before I just announced on the fly that I was going to be in LA and 15 people showed up at Garcons and Cafe in LA. It's this little wine bar. Mathieu was awesome. We had a great time. I need to give a shout out to Cassie H who helped organize it. She Mm -hmm. knows everybody in LA. And it was just, we had a fantastic time and we had How many of those patrons knew each other ahead of time? Andy, who I've known for a really long time, and Patricia and Jonathan. Okay, who but you know, a but very yes. small percentage. Yeah, now and they're so now the they're patrons. a whole new they're their own clique. That's patron. That's the power of patron. Right. I mean, I, you, you need know, to do funny. this in every city. I know we have done it, and the trips have brought people together. It really is a community. I think that's the greatest thing about Patreon is that we get together in these live events, and then all of a sudden. All these people are hanging out together, and it's great. You guys were awesome. Anyway, it is the definition of community, and if you want a real wine community where literally you're going to meet real wine friends and you think that you want to be part of this, it's patreon.com slash wine for normal people. So shout out to all of the people that came. Very exciting to see everybody. It's nice to get back out there again. We should do shout outs. We haven't done them in a long time, so let's get to that real quick. We need to thank Teddy G., Charles M, Wendy O, Christy W, Shelly, Melissa C, Robert E, Judy W, Ivan M, Donna S, 
Lorenzo Musliao, who is from Andes, who's a really good friend of mine. Lorenzo, thank you for joining. You really did not have to do that, but you are the best. And everybody should go get his wines from Andes, some of the best in the Sierra foothills. Sarah H. and Elsa, thank you all so much for being patrons, and I hope others will choose to join you. So um, this week, I'm so glad you're back. I missed you. You were the one that was away, remember? I... I know you're referring to the last podcast. This week, we are back with a great miniseries. And this is a grape that I recommend a lot in the roundups. Like when we do like wines for fall or wines for spring or summer or whatever. Mm -hmm. It seems like I'm always talking about Blaufrankisch. And we really like Blaufrankisch a lot. It is also known as a Lemberger. And it's also known as Limburger. But Related not to, to the be, cheese? No. No? Mm-mm, no, it's Just not stinky at all. Just a coincidence, really. <laughs> well, I don't is it, think so. Is there so. a town Limburger? Yes, there okay. is. It's E-R means, you know, of, of. It's like the apostrophe S. So it's Limburg's. Limburg is a town in Niederösterreich, which is in Austria. But then there's also a town called Lemberg in Austria. Not to be cu- confused with Bill Lumberg. From Office Space. Office Space. Who was so TPS crazy, he was in suits. I know. Like, He's incredibly yeah, versatile. I will just remind anybody who has not seen Office Space, it really is the God. epitome of what office life is oh, like. It really is. Anyway, Blau Frankish is a Central European red grape. It really what? is a grape you need to know about because it's a medium-bodied red that fits into, like, every category. I mean, it really checks boxes. You can get heavier versions. You get lighter versions. It's high in acidity, medium tannin. It's one of these wines. It's sort of like a Merlot type of grape Yum. where it fits a lot of profiles. Okay. The only thing about it is it can be a little spicy, but not always. So That's if you don't spi- like, I spicy, like spicy. Obviously, you know, I like spicy. <clears throat> ha, ha, mm-hmm. ha. It was planted throughout the Habsburg Empire. Now the biggest plantings are still in its homeland. Austria and Hungary. Can I ask a question about the name, though? Because every time you say it, I hearken back to the high school days when we all cared about car stereos, and Blauplunk was one of the brands that oh, really? the kids liked. Yes, which means blue dot. Right, Blau means blue. Right. In German. So the right. What, how does that relate to the so grape? Blue, and then Frankish. The Franks. The Germans were Franks. So Frankish. The origins are in the Franks. It's the blue wine of the Franks. It's the Austrian Why name. Why is it blue? Because the skin is blue-black. Oh, it is. It's okay. a dark, dark color. Yeah, so generally speaking, when you get a Blau Frankish, it's going to be fairly dark in color. But I just want to go back to where this grape is from. It likely is from Austria. It's the second most planted red there. And it has been crossed with Saint Laurent in Austria to make Zweigelt, which is the first most planted red in Austria. It's also grown in Hungary. Actually, the plantings in Hungary dwarf those in Austria, where it is called Cake Frankosch. There's some in Germany where it's called Lemberger. This is Mm -hmm. part of the problem for the grape. It doesn't have one name. It has several. In Slovakia and the Czech Republic, in Bulgaria and Croatia, it goes by different names there too. And then In the U.S., you have it in the Finger Lakes, where it's usually known as Lemberger, but sometimes Blau Frankish. Long Island, it's known as Blau Frankish. Washington State calls it Lemberger. California, usually Blau Frankish. Michigan, I think they usually call it Blau Frankish there. Also, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Colorado. It's grown in a lot of marginal climates, and that is mainly because it is winter hardy. See, I wish I knew that because I was out looking for a bottle of Blau Frankish earlier and I couldn't find any. But I did see Lemberger from the Finger Lakes. And if I had known... Yeah, it was in the same section, but Ah. I didn't make the association at all. Well, there you go. So Blau Frankish, Blue Wine of the Franks, it's the Austrian name probably around since medieval times. And actually, the way that they divided the grapes, and this is a little bit weird, it's the, the Hunich grapes which were the lower tier, and then the Frankish grapes, which were the higher tier. Okay. And Blau Frankish is a cross of, you could use the Italian name of Zulzina or Blauer Zimtrabe, and Weisser Unish. So it was part of a Unish grape. Weisser Unish is 
Gouet Blanc. Gouet Blanc is the parents of Chardonnay, of Gamay. Oh, wow. Uh, you okay. know, I mean, it has a lot of pedigree. Blanc Frankish was documented in 1862 at a grape exposition in Vienna, although we do believe that it's been around since the Middle Ages. It just wasn't named Blanc Frankish. Yeah, the Romans brought it in from somewhere. No, and yet... it's originally from Austria. Okay. So, no, it wasn't brought from anywhere. It was mentioned as Lemberger about 25 years later in Germany in 1877 later as Limburger. So again, Lemberg in Styria, Steiermark in southern Austria, or Limburg, which is the former name of the town of Masseau in Niederstreich. It's Lemberg's or Limburg's grape. In Hungary, it was mentioned in 1890 as Cake Frankos, which is the literal translation of Blau Frankos in Hungarian. This is what's so confusing. It's Cake Frankos in Hungary, but actually, that means Blau Frankish. So Limburger or Lemberger doesn't mean that. But Blau Frankish and Cake Frankish mean the same thing. Do you remember that Seinfeld episode when they went downtown and Kramer ended up at the nexus of the universe, the corner of first and first? Oh, my gosh, yes. I feel like I've that been at that of. corner I have before. Too, yes. Yeah, did not know it was the nexus of the universe when I was there. It felt rather dangerous, actually. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was right before Alphabet City really got, you right. know, kind of cool. Anyway. The grape is, like I said, bigger in Hungary, but its development as a quality wine in Hungary, there's a big difference because you had a Hungary that was under the influence of the Iron Curtain, right. and then you had Austria, which wasn't. So Austria has done more with the grape, although not as much as it should have, and Hungary has done less with the grape, so we don't see as much quality wine coming out of there, although that is changing very quickly. But Blau Frankish at one point was actually thought to be Pinot Noir or Gamay. Crazy enough, in Croatia, it's called Borgonja, oh, okay. right? Burgundy, Borgonia. Right. That's the translation of it. Mm -hmm. And in Bulgaria, it's called Gamay. And what is crazy is Blau Frankish is actually related to Gamay through Gouet Blanc. It's not related to Pinot, but it is related to Gamay through Gouet Blanc. And it has characteristics of Gamay. The reason that I'm bringing all this up, besides the fact that it's important to know, is that part of the problem for Blau Frankish mm -hmm. is that it is not one grape. I can't think of any red that is popular in Central Europe that is popular in the world. So I'm in general, you know, people say, well, it's because it has a lot of different names. I think some of this is a problem that Austrian reds in general are not very well known. And certainly the wines of Hungary beyond Tokai, maybe Formans, which we did another great mini series on, people don't really know these grapes. So the Austrians have a PR problem is what you're saying. I think the bigger problem is as it spread, especially to the United States, because that's the main place in the new world where people are growing the grape. Mm -hmm. Some people are calling it Blau Frankisch and some people are calling it Lemberger. And usually they're calling it Lemberger. I think Blau Frankisch is probably a better name for it. Lemberger is Lemberger, too close to Limburg cheese. Yeah, which has got, got a negative connotation for a lot of people. For me, it does. Yeah. I don't know that that was the right way to go. And if I were them, I would change the name. But it is what it is. Then so, you should just compromise and call it Blauberger or something. There actually is a is a oh, blau geez, burger. Yeah, so you can't really do that. There's a lot of blau grapes because blue and purple, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they're dark in color. So let's get to the vineyard. These are large grapes, dark skin. The berries are bluish black, and it's demanding in terms of where it grows. So if it's too cold during flowering, you're going to get coulure, which is poor flowering, which leads to poor fruit set, which leads to a bad crop. I thought you were just trying to pronounce color like you were British. Uh, no, <laughs> that would be... No. <laughs> Very funny. Sorry, our Too British listeners. Too um, much Moira from <clears throat> Creek recently. Oh, such a... That show's so hilarious. Second round is even better. Yes. It is vigorous. It can get to high yields, which is why some of it has not been so great in Hungary, frankly. Blau Frankish buds early and ripens late. In its homeland is the Pannonian Plain, which we've talked about many times. 
in Eastern Austria or Western Hungary, the Pannonian Plain is this flat area and it gets very, very warm there. Very warm winds come across the Pannonian Plain. That's only gotten hotter with climate change. So Hmm. these grapes have gotten riper. It's definitely been a a net benefit for Blaufrankisch and actually all of the reds of Austria. It is a late ripener. So you really have to be careful because in these continental climates where it grows, it starts to get cold and then you start bumping up against problems with ripeness because you got to take it off the vine before it gets frozen. It also has downy and powdery mildew. So if it's too wet, you're definitely going to have to spray something to make sure that you're fighting against the mildew. So one thing that you mentioned when you were describing the grape was that it was a fairly large berry. I would have assumed the opposite. I mean, because when I think of dark grapes or bluish grapes, they're smaller because it's more concentrated. These skins are very, very dark. I mean, they're blue-black in color. Hmm. So as soon as you start the process of pressing, crushing, maceration, you're going to get a lot of pigment out of them. Okay. I mean, most Blaufrankisch is fairly dark in color just because of that pigment that it develops over the course of time. It's also taking a long time of the growing season. So lots of pigment is developing in these grapes. It just happens to be one that once you start macerating it, if the grape skins are that dark, you can get it in two ways. One, you can have larger berries with very pigmented skin, or you can have small berries that have dark skins also, it'll be easier to get the pigment out very, very quickly in that low skin to juice ratio. Here's the characteristics of it, and then we'll get into the region. So it's pretty versatile. So if you want, you can make a light red or a rosé that's fruity and light. More of a pinot Yes. Style? Right. It's okay. say more of a gamay, gamay type right. style because that's it yeah, has I'm more sorry, well that. that's my word for Pinot. The, okay. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I call them yes. the same. You can call it Burgundy. That not they don't they don't call it Pinot, they call it Bourgogne. So it can make light fruity reds or it can make these dark, full bodied, heavy reds that have a lot of oak on them also. And it also can go into blends. Hmm. In general, Blaufrankisch is medium-bodied, and it has these lovely berry notes. It reminds you of like strawberry or raspberry, cherry blueberry Mm -hmm. sometimes, and then some like black cherry notes. The ones that I like best have spice, black pepper spice. They are peppery, and they can be very savory also, a little bit herbal. They can also be floral. I do have to say that when I get a Blaufrankisch and it doesn't have that black pepper note, I find it a little disappointing. Really? That doesn't mean that it's not good. If it's got some of those darker fruit notes, it can be very nice. But I like the ones that are peppery. And this is black pepper, not green pepper. No, but they can have that too. Remember that overcropping issue under ripeness. You pick it too early, you might get some of that green pepper. So the other thing about it, besides that pepper spiciness, is that it has awesome acidity, even in warmer vintages. So it maintains and hangs on to that acidity. On the other side of it, it can have tannin, not high tannin, Mm -hmm. but kind of like a little bit more than medium tannin. And it's got a little bitterness on the finish occasionally. So it does kind of Okay, with high acid, high tannin, I was going to say high acid, high tannin, and maybe some bitterness. Can you drink it alone? You can if it's got some of the fruit and spice to back it up. What about drinking it without food? Ha, ha, ha. (laughs) Very, very funny. Gosh, you're you're so lame. Your jokes are horrible. The kids love what, them. They actually really hate no, them. They do really um, hate them. I know. So the thing about Blaufrankisch that is only just being understood, and we'll talk about this as we talk about Austria, is that it needs time actually in the bottle. We're not usually giving it that probably the time that it needs because there are some people that are aging it for ten years. 15 Uh years and are saying that that is really making this grape sing. So I think that this is just the beginning of the horizon for this grape. But let's pop over to the regions and we'll concentrate a lot on Austria, some on Hungary, a little on Germany, and then just talk about places where there's little bits of it growing. In Austria, Blaufrankisch is the second most planted red grape after Zweigelt, which is its Mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. The plantings are about 
2,580 hectares or 6,375 acres. It's only about 6% of Austria's plantings. The big grape in Austria is... Zweigelt. <laughs> of course, exactly. Gruner Veltlin are very good MCIs. And Riesling is also quite popular. I would popular. have said so Riesling. Germany is Riesling territory. Austria's main grape is Gruner Veltliner. So that's where you're going to find most of the plantings. But in terms of red plantings, Blaufrankisch is number two. It is mostly in one section of Austria also where Gruner does not dominate, and that's in Bergenland. Make your joke about the Trolls MCIs. You always love to make your Bergen oh, the Bergens, joke. Right? yes. You know they're coming out with a third movie now. He's, he's in a they, boy band. Who? Justin um, Timberlake? No, yes. Character? His character. Oh, God, that's hilarious. That It's kind of funny. But what's so crazy is they played that preview, and I didn't think it sounded like him. It's totally him, and yeah, his character's in a boy band. That's and actually, great. NSYNC recorded a reunion song for it. This has nothing to do with Bergenland in Austria, but it no, is nice NSYNC trivia. No, NSYNC was huge in Austria. Okay. <laughs> it's mostly in northern, central, and southern Bergenland. There's a little bit in eastern Niederösterreich, lower Austria. That's mostly where Gruner and Riesling are, frankly. So Bergenland is really the province of red grapes, and Blaufrankisch, as I said, is the second most planted. It is the flagship variety in a few regions. You have places like Eisenberg, Mittelbergenland, which is actually known as Blaufrankischland, and Leiteberg. And it is also big in an area called Karnuntum, which is in Niederösterreich. In Bergenland alone, out of those 2,580 hectares, it's 2,442 hectares. Hmm. 94% of Blaufrankisch is in Bergenland, just about 6%, 147 hectares or 363 acres are in Niederstreich. Hmm. Bergenland is really going to be the focus. It is warmer here and it's sheltered. So there's hills all over the place. There's the influence of the Pannonian Plain and those winds coming in from the east, which make this area good for reds. And the thing to know about Austria is that Austria has winemaking traditions that go back to the Romans. But the modern wine industry is relatively young because you had a number of wars. You had the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was very important, obviously, in Austria. Right. And when that fell, things did not go well for Austria. Then its role in both wars was not great. And what <laughs> happened after. And then you had the antifreeze scandal right. in the 1980s, 80s, where yeah. although no one died, unlike with Barbera in Italy, we talk about that another time, it was an enormous scandal and the government took it very seriously. So if you think about it, it's only been the last. 30, 40 years, they've had to rebuild from scratch. So if that is the case for places with Gruner, yep. where that's the flagship grape, you can imagine how difficult it could be for a place like Bergenland, where no one's heard of Blaufrankisch, no one's heard of Zweigelt, no one's heard of Saint Laurent. And then you have Pinot Noir and Merlot, but people generally don't associate Austria with reds. So now this mm -mm. is a new thing where people are saying, oh, it's not just Gruner and Riesling. Mm -hmm. Now there's some other things as well. Zweigelt is still the most popular grape, but I believe that a lot of critics or a lot of wine experts find that Blaufrankisch is more interesting. It used to be that the wines were either too light or... Or they used to oak the hell out of them, and then you get these really boring wines that were just like a block of oak and, and nothing else. But then other people started making Blaufrankisch in the Burgundian style, mm -hmm. lighter, more expressive of the terroir, and that started to work. So in Burgenland, like I said, you have that hot continental Pannonian climate, which is great for reds. The summers are very dry. Blaufrankisch can handle both heat and drought. And it can handle cold winters. The heat and cold winters, that's really unusual. Yeah. Well, not really, because continental climates, if it is truly a continental grape, it's going to have to do well in cold winters with hot summers, because that's what continental climates are. Hmm. You also have this ideal soil type here. 60% of the soils in Bergenland are sandy gravel with schist 
and nice and combinations of soils that work really, really well that are medium. They're not too heavy, but they reflect light and heat and hold on to hmm. it at night if the nights get cooler. There's also a little bit of clay in Mittelbergenland and in Leiteberg, there's limestone. So you get some different wines. We're going to take a step away from the podcast to thank our sponsor this week, Wine Access. Go to wineaccess.com slash WFMP, 10% off your first order. And trust me, once you get onto the site, you are going to see spectacular wines at all prices. Wine Access really does believe the problem with wine is getting access to some of the greatest wines in the world. So they've got the most expensive and greatest wines in the world, and they also have things that you can't find anywhere else at all price levels from all over the place. As we're coming up on the holidays, it's a great time for you to hop on to wineaccess.com slash WFMP and take a look at what they have. There are so many different wines that are going to go well with Thanksgiving, bubbly for New Year's. I always like to stock up at this time of year. You never know when you might get invited to a holiday party. Order a bunch of wine from Wine Access. Once you hit $150 in your cart, you get free shipping. That saves you so much versus other sites. It's a great deal. In addition, ask for or buy someone a Wine Access gift card as a holiday gift. The thing about Wine Access is that because it is curated, it is a gateway into a world of really fantastic wines. Go to wineaccess.com slash WFNP. Get that gift card for somebody special and introduce them to a spectacular site. Wineaccess.com slash WFNP. 10% off your first order. And just a reminder, we've already talked about Patreon, but join today. Help keep the podcast going. P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash WFNP wine for normal people. And I'm going to be posting a bunch of classes for January. The annual sparkling wine class always fills up. That's on December 30th. You can buy the wines for that class and drink them the next night for New Year's. It's super fun, technical and dorky, but also awesome. And you get these fantastic wines. And you can also get somebody a wine for normal people gift certificate if you think that they would be interested in taking a class. That can also be found at winefornormalpeople.com slash classes, and that's where you'll register for classes as well. Check it out today, and now let's get back to the show. Eisenberg, DAC, that's the basically their AOC system, the okay. denomination of controlled origin. This is in the southernmost part of Bergenland. It is a small area with small producers. Actually, most of the people in Eisenberg cultivate wines as a side business or passion project. Hmm. A lot of the wine is sold locally in taverns. This is where the continental and Mediterranean climates meet. You have a lot of dryness here and a lot of heat. Does that mean at the there are a lot of time. microclimates? There are a lot of microclimates, but Eisenberg is small and is all formed around a hill, the hill of Eisenberg. The reds of southern Bergenland have been called Eisenberger since the Middle Ages because this is where the best Blau Frankish has always been from. This is slaty soils, actually. So you're going to get some spiciness in these wines with silt, sand, gravel. The vineyards are on slopes, iron rich soils, too. So you're going to get some extra flavor. These are earthy. These are spicy. They're tannic. They are delicious. A little bit hard to come by, but they've got this kind of citrusy mineral note, actually, to hmm. them. So earthy, but then also minerals. Some are bigger if they're from warmer sites and they have a little more tannin and then you've got to age them. But these can be served chilled, beautiful wines from Eisenberg. It makes sense that there's a hill in Eisenberg. Do you know what berg means? Mountain. Yeah. Do you know what Eisen means iron. It does very yeah, good. Yeah, iron mountain. So iron yeah. mountain. Yep. That makes sense because of the iron rich soils. Ah. Yes. Mittelbergenland, known as Blaufrankisch land, literally because it's Austria's key Blaufrankisch wine growing region. Blaufrankisch here really took hold in the seventies and early eighties. Mm -hmm. The southern slopes of the Odenberg Mountains, protected from weather. This is a sunny dry region. You get those warm, dry winds from the Pannonian Plain. 
What's here is heavy loam soils, which are usually really fertile, mm-hmm. but it works for Blaufrankisch. It stores the water. So when there isn't water during the growing season, loam is going to hold on to that water and release it back to the grapes when they need it. And the wines are much more powerful from Mittelbergenland than they are from Eisenberg. They have more tannin. They're going to be much more age-worthy. Now, on the upper slopes, you have more slate and limestone, so there are lighter style wines there. Mm -hmm. But mostly, you're going to have bigger wines. Also, Lake Neudsel is here. On the east side of the lake, you get bigger fruit, lower tannin, and full-bodied wines. And on the southern side, you have clay-rich soils, so that's where you get spice and tannin. In Mittelbergenland, they've got single vineyards, the Ried Wines. They have reserve wines with longer aging requirements. The young wines are dark and spicy Mm -hmm. with red berry fruit, or they can be heavy and a little bit brooding and need some age in order to come around. So that is in Mittelbergenland. In Leiterberg, the other place in Bergenland where they make some very serious Blaufrankisch, this is limestone and slate. This is on the eastern slopes of the Leiter range. You keep hearing me say this on the slopes, on the slopes, right. on the slopes. This is where this grape does best. As you're looking at up places the slopes, on the lower no, slopes, oh, right? Well, that's, that was my point. Lower yeah, slopes or upper too, slopes? No, no, you can't okay. go too high. The soil types get a little bit thin and it gets too cold and this mm. grape needs some warmth to develop. But complex wines out of Leiterberg, west of Lake Neudsel, there's orchards and other stuff in Leiterberg, but this is an old growing region. In fact, they recently found grape seeds from the 8th century. Century BCE. So they've been making wine for nearly 3,000 years Jeez. here. Limestone in Leiteberg means that you're going to get some salinity, aroma, elegance. Those diurnal swings mm-hmm. on the range are going to make that happen. So those are three major DACs. But then you also just have the regular Bergenland state wines. These are from a larger area, and they are also really delicious. If you're looking... Are they like village wines? Bergenland is like an entire... It would be like a California type wine. Uh, You know, it's their state, although it's much smaller. And then you have these individual regions that would be, to use the California analogy, like Napa and Sonoma and Santa Barbara. The best producers... Morick is generally considered the top in Bergenland. Nittnaus, Wachter, Weisler, Krutzler... Meinklang and Preler, those are some good producers that are here and they are available in the U.S. Mm -hmm. You have to read the tasting notes because it can be that they're minerally and and have salinity, but they can also be very oaky. It's quite a range. It is. It's what you do with the grape and how long Mm -hmm. you let it hang, but also the terroir terroir. because as we said- Because it's versatile. It'll- it'll It'll do a lot of different things, yep. but it's going to it's gonna be based on where you grow it and who grows it. Also, I would be remiss if I did not mention Carnantum in Nidostreich. That's going eastward from Vienna to the Austrian border with Slovakia. Mm-hmm. Goes south of the Danube across a couple of hilly areas, including the Leiter Range. Here you have heavy loam and low soils, so these wines can get a lot of body and a lot of flavor. Now, the thing about Carnuntum is that although it is a very old area, actually named for a Roman general, it was not very well known. So a young generation of wine growers really came in here and have been concentrating a lot on Blaufrankisch, hmm. especially in the Spitzeberg area in the east. Dorley Murr is the big producer here. She actually runs a PR agency, but she's also made big waves in Carnuntum as oh, well. just doing that on the side, sure. Making nice. excellent wines on the side. Mm-hmm. That is Austria, where I would say the best Blaufrankisch comes from. So if you're going to try your first glass of Blaufrankisch ordered from Austria, is what you're saying? I would say so. Just to be safe? It's the easiest to find, certainly from Bergenland. If you can find something from Eisenberg or Leiteberg or Mittelbergenland, do it, because the more focused the DAC is or the Appalachian is, Mm -hmm. the better the wine oftentimes, although there's some great wines out of Bergenland also. And again, Carnantum has interesting Blaufrankisch. You see new Blaufrankisch popping up all the time because as the climate is warming a bit, Austria it's does been planted have planted in more places. Y- yes, but it's cold hardy in places that experience warm summers and very cold winters. Blaufrankisch will survive. It's just that you need enough warmth to be able to make it it's, well. 
Bergenland, we do these national borders, but Mother Nature knows no borders. So a continuation of Hungary's Pannonian Plain is Bergenland. Bergenland and the Pannonian Plain and Hungary are connected, although there are a lot of diverse regions within Hungary to grow cake Frankosh. Again, the name for Blau Frankish and Hungarian. Is, is there enough difference among the regions within Hungary that you need to be cognizant of? Yes. Or pay attention to what we're Yes, you're there okay. are some low quality ones and some high quality ones. Okay. Cake Frankish is considered one of Hungary's best red wine varieties with Kadarka. First mentioned in 1890 in Hungary, I mentioned that already. It's the most widely planted grape. In Hungary, it's cultivated on 8,000 hectares or 19,768 acres. Half of the world's Blaufrankisch or Cake Frankisch is in Hungary. It's almost three times as much as what's in Austria. That's amazing. Yeah. Most of it, though, unfortunately, is in a region that I'm not going to say right, but it's Kunsag, K-U-N-S-A-G, but there's an accent on it. Is it Hungarian for jug wine? It could be, (laughs) because this is where the low-cost wine is produced in okay. Hungary. They actually call it sand-grown wines because sand there's sand here. Not like the sand-grown wine we had in Portugal where it was grown like literally in the Oh, sand, no, Colarish, right? yes. which was amazing. Yes. No, no, no. This is sandy, but it's light and soft. They don't have good aromatics. By the way, this is how they describe it on the Wines of Hungary website. I just want to be clear. I'm not making this up. They describe their own region this way. Self-deprecation can be charming. Well, I think the thing about Europe that I always appreciate is they're usually pretty honest. Like, if they have a bad vintage, they'll be like, yeah, this vintage really sucked, and these are, like, the three good things you can get out of it. It's amazing. Because they're old cultures. It's like people, right? When you get older, you're (laughs) like, you're like, so honest. You know what? I don't care anymore. We're good. We'll figure it out. It's pretty hilarious. (laughs) But the hilly regions are where you're going to get better wines. The other place where there's a lot of bull cake Frankosh is Eger, which is bull's blood. Egri Bicavir. Mm. Cake Frankosh is important because it gives acidity and some spice and red berry fruit to, to bull's blood. But not really considered the highest quality, although they're trying to get Egri Bicavir better. It's, it is what it is. Okay. The better Cake Frankosh, Blau Frankosh, whatever, is from Sopron. This is the most important wine district for Cake Frankosh. It's in the northwest, in the foothills of the Alps. It's a direct contest continuation of Leiteberg hmm. and Neudsel. It is right next to Bergenland. It's basically the so same. So are the styles the same? Very, very close. It's got light to limestone. It has loess and gravel. The same things I just said about Bergenland mm-hmm. are true for Sopran. It's continental, cool, rainy. The difference here is that it's much windier than over in Bergenland. Cake Frankosh is floral with lighter tannins from Sopron. So if that's something that sounds appealing, it would be very interesting, and I've never done this, to do a tasting of Cake Frankosh from Sopron and then wines from Leita and the other areas of Bergenland, just to see if there's any difference at all. There's also Sexard, which always is a controversial name to say. Clearly done for marketing purposes. Right. Sexard has... I heard sex art sells. Yes. Continental climate, hot summers. This is lighter than other Hungarian reds. Softer tannins, still age-worthy. They look at the Blau Frankisch from sex art as being very, very high quality and lighter in style. Not flimsy, though. Not flimsy. Okay. The other places, while we're in Eastern Europe, Slovakia and the Czech Republic, here it's called Frankova. I'm sorry for my poor Czech, but that's how I, I'm going to say it, Frankova. A little bit more in Slovakia than in the Czech Republic, but we're talking about like 3,400 acres or 1,300 hectares, and that's in Slovakia. And mm-hmm. in the Czech Republic, it's about 3,000 acres or 1,200 hectares. They make a lot of Blau Frankish relative to the grape, but it's just not well known. You're not going to see a lot of Frankova come out of there. But if you happen to be traveling in Prague, for instance, where a lot of people do travel, right. and you see Frankova, know that that is Blau Frankish. Hmm. Germany. I've already told you. It's Lemberger or Limburger. Right. The growing area for Lemberger is really in Württemberg. It makes up 15% of the vineyard area in Württemberg. Württemberg is the red wine area in Germany. It's got about 15,000 
family owned vineyards. Oh my God. Co ops are going to be essential sure. to pooling together that it's really wine. That's fragmented. Right. And the other thing is, the region has the highest wine consumption in all of Germany. So most of the reds that are made in Württemberg don't even see the national market, let really? alone the international market. They're drinking everything they make. Yeah, yeah, seriously. But just for thoroughness, Württemberg, it's around Stuttgart that you see oh, these wines okay, being okay. made. Mm -hmm. They're lighter and softer. Climate's a little mild for Germany. The rivers here are going to make it warm, hot and dry summers, exactly what you need for this grape mm -hmm. in the continental climate. Limestone soils, I think you know what I'm going to say, are going to make lighter wines sure. that are more aromatic. And then you have some marl and loess, which is windblown silk is loess, mm -hmm. and that's going to make these wines rather light. But then you have some clay where you can get a little bit heavier wines. Okay. Now, most of these wines are light and fruity, but there are some people experimenting with doing heavier wines. As climate changes come, you can do that because you've got more warmth in Württemberg and tannins, and they're adding oak also. Blackberry, cherry, plum, and what they are known for is having vegetal notes. Oh, really? Bell pepper in the Blaufrankisch. Why do well, you think that is? Well, you said it was a flaw. Not a flaw. Earlier. It's just, it's not a flaw. Okay, so it wasn't a flaw, but you said if it's not ripe enough, and I extrapolated that into Bingo. flaw this. Not necessarily a flaw because okay. sometimes, you know, those vegetal notes can be really nice in Cabernet Franc in low levels. You can get in Cabernet Sauvignon in low levels in Bordeaux and it can be very nice. But why are you getting bell pepper here and you did not hear me say anything about that nope. in Austria or Hungary? No. Big difference. People always say Germany and Austria. No, all you need to do is try a Riesling from Austria and try a Riesling from Germany, and you can see the heat difference. Mm -hmm. it's, it's measurable and appreciable. And then when you get into areas like Bergenland, which is now getting Pannonian influence, the warmth factor is multiplied. And so you're not going to have problems with getting vegetal wines at all. Anywhere, I've never had a vegetal red from Austria. Never. I've had mm. some that are tart as hell, and not well made, but I've never had a Blau Frankish that tasted like bell pepper ever from Austria. And it's rare that you would unless they had a really bad vintage hmm. or you have a bad producer who picks too early or the site is too cold. But bell pepper is from coolness. All right. What can I tell you about the U.S. wines that are mainly called Lemberger? I can't tell you a whole lot because it's the same problem that we talk about with all wines in the U.S., which is that everybody can go their own way. There isn't a DAC regulation or an AOC regulation. In Washington, people grow it in Yakima, Horse Heaven Hills. They grow hmm. it all over the place. It's mostly in central Washington. You're not going to see it in Walla Walla. But you'll see it in some of these areas where you have heat during the day, right. cool nights, and then, again, they have cold winters. So it's a great place for that. In the desert. In, in the desert, right, right. Puget Sound couldn't grow lemberger. No, but I was I was sort of working my way backwards down to Willamette Valley. They're not growing a lot. I do think that there are a few producers doing Blaufrankisch somewhere in Oregon. I cannot remember where, but I think I've seen that before. Look, in New York and the Finger Lakes, I looked it up. There's a few people that are doing Blaufrankisch, calling it lemberger. So they're doing lemberger in bourbon barrels. Why is that? Because you can't get it ripe enough. Ooh. And in warmer vintages in the Finger Lakes, in warmer sites, I think they can do it. It doesn't get super flaming hot ever because of the lake effect. Because the Finger Lakes are so deep that they keep it cool in the summertime and keep it warmer in the wintertime. That's the really interesting it's, thing about those lakes. They're you want so a deep. real old school reference? Yes. It's the, the McDLT of what is regions. The McDLT? It was a McDonald's invention back in the 80s. What is the DLT? Delicious lettuce and tomato. It's a quarter pounder with lettuce and tomato, but it came in a styrofoam package where oh, the God. where the meat was on the bottom half of the bun on one side, so the hot stays hot. And then uh, they had the top bun with lettuce, tomato, and cheese on the other side. Can I let my hippie flag fly and tell you that you probably could still find one of those in the middle of a landfill of somewhere? Of course, because sure. It's still the styrofoam, alive styrofoam is styrofoam. going to be there for well, I'm sure the burger generations. And the, oh, and probably the lettuce, the I'm going to put yes. that in quotation yes. marks, and that fake bread, gross. Yes, it is true that the lake effect is whatever you just said. But... <laughs> 
The Finger Lakes has Lemberger. Some people also talk about those green pepper notes in the Finger Lakes. So it's going to depend on site. Washington, again, you don't see a lot of that green pepper note. I think Washington is a bit more like Bergenland. Oh. Long Island, Channing Daughters, which we've never been to. I, I think maybe next year I might have to hit it when, because my sister is telling me that I have to come to her high school reunion, but I can't go to the high school reunion itself. I have to stay in the hotel while she and her best friend go to the hotel. No, we're staying in Coliseo. Oh, you're coming also? If we're getting Coliseo pizza. She didn't say you could come. She said only me. I don't have to come. She doesn't have to even know I'm there. Oh, I'll I just like meet you plan. at the pizza place. Will you come place? to the wineries with me? I hate going of alone. Of course, yes. All right, okay, so we're going to do that. Maybe we'll have a patron hangout at Coliseo. Ooh, that would be good. Yeah, but then everybody has to go to the uh, yeah. chef. Like, what would be the point, you know? For, for Coliseo, it's worth it. But we would maybe go to Channing Daughters and have the Blau Francis there. California has a little bit. I have read about a couple of producers in Santa Barbara making oh, down Blau there? Francis and a few others. Santa Barbara, especially in Santa Inez, you're going to get oh, warm days. Got nice temperature. And yes, mm-hmm. and some cooler nights. Michigan, perfect for that continental mm. climate, really warm summers. Canada's got some Blau Francis, Ontario, British Columbia, Australia, teeny tiny bit in Adelaide Hills. I am sure that there's probably other producers besides this one in Adelaide Hills, but that's the one everybody talks about when they talk about Blau Francis in Australia. Where is Adelaide Hills? It is in South Australia. Okay. It's up in the Mount Lofty Ranges. Okay. It's up in the, that the makes hills. Sense that it's yeah. South Australia. Yeah. New Zealand in 2019, the first varietal Blau Frankish hmm. was produced from Hans Herzog. So there's that. That was in Marlboro. And the other place, which may seem surprising, that grows Blau Frankish is in Italy, in Friuli. Now, this should what do make they call sense. It? They call it Franconia Nera. Franconia, the grape of the Francs, Nera, black. The grape came from Austria. Italy has a lot of these grapes. They do make Gewürztraminer. They have Riesling right. up in the Friuli and Alto Adige regions because of, it's right next to Austria. Friuli Isonzo DOC, crossed by the river Isonzo. It goes to the Slovenian border. It can be 100% Franconia. Really interesting that they make this grape Varietally. Yeah, that's really strange. And then there's also the Friuli Latisana DOC, which is also in the Asanzo Basin near the Adriatic coast, near a seaside resort in the Veneto region. Hmm. That's got low soils. Really, you never hear about low soils in Italy, in Italy but in right. this little pocket in Friuli, great for red wines. And you can do Franconia Nera red there also. Hmm. I will mention another little rarity because they're just things that are mentioned in books and websites and things like that. All near, the nerdy stuff that you read. Near Malaga in Spain, there's one producer that makes one? a Lemberger. Yes. So there you oh, go. Man. This grape is Talk everywhere. Talk about a niche market, right? It's everywhere. So what are you going to eat this with? The fundamentals, I'm going to say this. It can be hard to think about food and wine pairing And a lot of times when you are thinking about ideas for grapes like this, I will look on the websites and see, okay, well, what grows together goes together. But a lot of the food that is suggested on the wines of Hungary or the wines of Austria or the wines of Germany are things that most people who are listening to the show don't really eat. Yeah, where do pretzels grow? Yeah, yeah, (laughs) pretzels. I believe that they have a farm of them in Bavaria. Yes. But, um, I think schnitzel's a root vegetable, isn't it? Well, funny enough, I will tell you that most of the websites have food that we, in the U.S., in Canada, in the U.K., and in Australia, which are our four biggest, that's who listens to the show. Mm-hmm. If you're listening to the show, you are likely in one of those countries. Although we have people all over Italy right. and that's you know right. Japan and everywhere else. But those are our four largest ones. And by the way, Canada, sorry to say, the UK has just clobbered you. Oh, jeez. Step it up, Canada. Thank you, Brits. Our British audience has definitely grown a lot, so that's really kind of cool. The Australian audience is also growing like wildfire, so I'm really, really loving it. Canadians, you got to step up. But here's what I'll say. Most of the food that is recommended on some of the Eastern European websites are things, especially of um, the meat variety, Mm -hmm. that I think we don't usually eat. 
So I did love that on the Wines of Hungary website, they took it up a level. And what they said was, here are the types of foods that may go really really? well with cake francos. Root vegetables. Yes. Potatoes. Yep. Mushrooms, beets, which are really a root vegetable. Eggplant. Tomatoes because of the acidity. Yep. Aged cheeses. And then on the meat side, roasted pork. Hmm. Lamb dishes with herbs, mm-hmm. duck all and these, goose are, all these are other earthy, things. Right. Like, you can do pasta and pizza and roasted vegetables and also fish soups, like Hungarian fish soup mm-hmm. would be something. Minestrone. For the fuller bodied styles, meatloaf. Don't you hate meatloaf? No, I like, like meatloaf. Oh, you do? Oh, I thought yeah. you hated it. No, I like meatloaf. Okay. So there's some herbs in meatloaf. That's yep, part of that's that. Right. Mm-hmm. Roasted meats. Those kinds of categories are incredibly useful. I wish more people would recognize that saying that sauterne and foie gras go together are just, that's just not realistic. I'm sure that they do. But a lot of people are not eating foie gras every yeah, day. So not every day, but if you want to have a sauterne, you might want to have something else to pair it with, you know? Yeah. We have had Blau Frankish, especially with the older cheeses like aged Gouda. It goes really, really well. It also goes well with savory dishes, mushrooms with herbs, and things with herbs really, really go quite nicely. Those heavier styles, though, if you want it with meat, you're going to have to go for something heavier because the acidity in these wines can make them a bit too light and they can be overpowered. Well, in the Northern Hemisphere, we're finally getting some fall-like weather. It sounds like a great fall wine. Perfect for fall and for Maybe spring. Maybe Thanksgiving? I mean... Yeah, that's Blau Frankish or Lemberger or Limburger or whatever you want to call it. I call Cake it Cake Frankish. It is an excellent grape. It's one that you should definitely know about. And I hope that this pushes you just a little bit to go out and seek it. The other thing that I will say, not very expensive. There are versions that are 40, 50 US dollars, Mm -hmm. but most of them lay within the 18 to 25 dollar range. And they are very, very good for that price. It's a good one for the grape mini series because it's a nice alternative varietal. Earlier this year, I was looking through some of the varietals that we've done this year for the Great Mini Series, and all of them have been kind of alternatives too. We did yeah. Pinot because it was a refresh, so. What is this an alternative to? So if I were if Gamay, someone, right? Yeah, Gamay, okay. Merlot, Pinot, maybe it has something in common with Menthea, which is another grape that we that's spicy and yep. medium bodied yep. like that. So if you're looking for wines that are in that milieu then nice. we have just recommended one for you. That is Blau Frankish, another one in the great mini maxi series, whatever the heck we want to call it at this point. And with that, this has been another episode of Wine for Normal People. Thank you so much for listening, and we will catch you next time.